present I would like to focus on this topic namely the animal ethics, a human relationship with domestic and wild animal. Once I finish this topic, I will try to address them. Now, we all know that there are species, there are endangered species, all of them and they need our help. They are crying for it that you please save us and we as human beings have ignored this, have stopped listening to uh, their cry. So, therefore, this whole idea of animal ethics or animal rights that, that people talk about today in 21st century is look at that where we have gone wrong, what kind of philosophical foundation has caused this harm to the life of animals and few of them are existing in countable numbers. So, this extinct animals community requires or demands in fact a, a compassionate approach which is uh, as I was talking about the, the approach which will uh, help us not only storing them uh, their life, not only conserving their life, but also will allow us to see that how both human beings and animals will collectively flourish in their endeavors. This flourishing attitude need not be only the personal attitude of the humans, but the humans being moral agents also allow other uh, non-human beings to flourish. Because as I said earlier referring to the teleological notion of life centric ethics that every individual has got a purpose in life. They not only exist, but also try to bloom you know, in their life, try to flourish in their life. And that attitude is inherently present in all living beings of the universe. That is the message we would like to give. But in a human centered ethic, the kind of duties that we have shown has allowed natural environment to deteriorate. So, therefore, the human centered ethics has to reform it, make it a life centered ethics, so that we do not allow whatever wrong has happened, has happened. Further, we do not allow the natural environment to deteriorate. Similarly, our we try to protect the wilderness uh, and that will show a kind of a responsibility, that will enhance our response. We do not treat ourselves as responsible agent, but our responsibility has been confined to some limited spheres of our life. And therefore, the urge here is to enlarge it, to expand it. Okay. So, uh, as I was talking about moral extensionism, moral extensionism is possible if we make an attempt to enlarge the scope of our moral discourse or that will help us exhibiting a, a very deep sense of responsibility that a moral agent poses towards any wilderness project that uh, they um, take up. And that will also exhibit our obligations. So, we are not only obliged to our fellow human beings or we do not uh, not only have obligation for our children, our students, our friends, but also we have uh, obligations for other non-human beings that are there in our surrounding. So, let us expand our self and be inclusive in our approach which will talk about a life centered ethics where there is equality. We say that we are all equal when it comes to our social ethics in a society. We say that you know, we are all equal, there should not be any untouchability in our society. Similarly, in, in environmental ethics which is life centric in nature that advocates a kind of equality which is biocentric that every living being same they are equal that has to be you know uh, a kind of a presuppositions when we talk about life centric ethics. Then we also need to link with our past what is good there in our past and try to as, as I was talking about we need to rethink about our religion, religious activities, religious beliefs and try to modernize that. Okay. So, therefore, we have to see what is good there in the past and how that can be connected for preserve the value for our future generation. So, there are two things uh, we have to do, we are living at present and we have to connect ourselves to the past, bring the good, the best of the past to us, so that 
we cultivate in such a way that we offer a better world to our future generation. And that is how we can think of long term value. People today have accepted, all of us including myself have accepted easy policy, how easily things can be done so that I live a comfortable life. Comfort is not only my requirement, my need, but it should be everybody's need. Now, everybody's need means people who are yet to come to the world, it, it will be also their need as well. So, therefore, it is my primary duty that I should create a value which will last long. So, when we conceptualize a policy, when we make a policy, we should see that, that for another 50 years or 25 years, nothing has to uh, be changed on that. We do not have a long term policy. Now, we do not have the first sight to see that what will be our future generation need that we do not really think, but many developed nations are thinking ahead of us because they prepare policy which will last long. So, they not only prepare policy for the, the present dwellers, but they also prepare policy for the future dwellers who will come and live in this beautiful world. And that is how their um, policy to preserve or the policy to uh, have a wilderness program as a world heritage is a meaningful pro project. But in our case, as my fellow participant uh, pointed out, that many national parks, many uh, heritage uh, lanes are being eaten up slowly, gradually and being utilized for human purpose only. Now, once you start encroaching the land of the home of the other non human beings, obviously they will fight or they will disappear. Many times you might be having this in the news that uh, the leopard attacked few villagers, the elephants have come to the town, they have spoiled the land, things like that. That precisely is happening because we are trying to eat up their home, the forest is their home. And once you destroy their home, where they will go? Either they will resist, they will, they will be very wild or they will be submissive to whatever you do. And in that process, they disappear and they become extinct species. So, therefore, when we talk about any policies, when we talk about ethics of a very enlightened uh, type like life centric ethics, we need to think of uh, policies which will last long or which will have values for our future generation as well. That is what is my concern. Those who talk about sustainable development, they must see to it that we modify, we transform our attitude so that there is a harmony and that harmony between the individual human beings, the human beings per se and the non-human beings are maintained. If you start maintaining that, then steadily we will reach to a kind of an equilibrium. So, human living beings are not isolated beings. Uh, they are not isolated from other forms of life. If one have a deep look into the, the concept of life itself, one tries to re-examine concept of life, what makes me human, then one has to connect to the other life forms, but sometimes it is because of our ignorance that we have been utilizing them, we have been making use of their life for our well being. And in that process, we have isolated ourselves, we have tried to claim that we belong to a different community, ok. But life centric ethics does not do that, life centric ethics respects to all forms of life. It tries to maintain that all life are to be respected and that is why, that is how you know the, the concept of reverence of life is meaningful because such an approach will put us together in one community called the biotic community and the biotic community not only think for the present generation, but will also think for future generations. I was referring to Derek Postoma yesterday, Derek William Postoma says that education is necessary to 
and light in every individual that there is an inter uh, generational responsibility that every individual should cultivate intergenerational responsibility this is a term which postama uses uh, when he talks about that why we should care for the environment we should care for the environment if you recollect we should care for the environment because we are human beings because we are citizen so it is in that context every citizen must cultivate the sense of responsibility which is intergenerational responsibility we are responsible for our fellow beings because they are also in trouble it is not that people who are yet to come as I said that the future society is yet to come and we have to offer them a good world, a good environment so that they cherish life much better than what is been given to us or what we experience in our everyday life. So therefore, we need to talk about uh, intergenerational uh, responsibility not only just a responsibility as a kind of a bare uh, concept. Now, when we uh, talk about uh, animals and animal rights, let us see that how we behave with them, what kind of attitudes are being expressed uh, by the humans uh, to uh, no, uh, animals. Now, we inflict pain on animals, we torture them, we kill them. Animals are also raised, they are being raised for foods. We used in our research, test a medicine say for example, when we test a research product, we uh, now use them. We have been use, you know, using them or inflicting pain on them when we are engaged in hunting, when we are engaged in fishing, they become a means to our pleasure. And many times you might have noticed in the countryside that there are lot of sports and entertainment program uses animals extensively. So, therefore, we need to really think uh, upon such issues that how and what kind of mode of engagement that we have with uh, animals, what kind of relationship that we share with uh, animals. Now, uh, today we, we live in a society where there is mass production and mass consumption and that is what is the message of globalization that you not only produce more, but also consume more. Now, this attitude, the, 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 the consumption process has you know um, has been so haphazard that there are lot of crises which is there particularly the health related crisis is due to the kind of a mass consumption uh, of uh, which are people are talking about uh, Maggi has been in the news for um, almost one week or so that how massively certain things are been consumed okay and uh, what we never bother about what will be their health impact when we consume things because we are not a, an enlightened society we have not developed things in a, in a much sophisticated way to, to test what is good for us what is good for the health of our children or health of what kind of health benefits a particular food item has. So, it is very recently people have started thinking more on this in India particularly, but in many developed nations they have proper institutional mechanisms to test uh, to notify to instruct the, the users that this is what an item contains. So, that you inform the consumer prior to their consumption and if the, the consumer is enlightened one if the consumer has the ability to purchase things, then they will be uh, consuming better things. So, here what I am interested uh, to share with you is this that many times our engagement with uh, animals and animal products have been such that we do not really care for our health when we consume them. So, there is an health impact which has to be also taken into account and when we talk about uh, biodiversity and the balance in ecosystems, we need to see that how such a diversity uh, can be maintained, how the balance could be maintained, so that we live a quality life. Yesterday, initiating my uh, debates on environmental ethics, I was talking about the meaningful life and meaningful life and quality life are not different. Rather, what we have meant quality life 
is a very comfortable happy life. We live in a society where many individuals only considers their happiness is uh, you know, the first priority. Of course, it is first priority. Say for example, being a parent, I have, I have the first priority that you know, my children should be happy. It is not it. Even if I have to work hard, but they should be happy. Now, similarly, when uh, if that is our concern, can that concern be a little extended to include other uh, people uh, into that particular uh, sphere of happiness, so that they live a quality life. So, the urge here is basically to develop an ethical concern towards other and not being individualistic in our approach. So, that is what a, is uh, the impact. Now, let us look at that how classically animals are been treated uh, since the kind of modern rationality uh, has been borrowed to uh, India, we need to see how uh, it has been practiced. Many of you have pointed out yesterday that this is not been an exclusively an academic program in Indian universities. Why environmental ethics is not taught in the school level? Now, at the school level, we do not find it because we have not thought about it and we have not prepared a curriculum which will help our children to develop an ethical attitude towards the other. So, therefore, the time has come that we need to prepare ourselves, think ourselves in those lines. Now, but if you look at the societies which are been enlightened societies and people in the enlightened societies have been talking about animal rights and they are talking in more in academic terms as well as in active terms. So, here I would be discussing some of the philosophers who advocate uh, and try to maintain in their theoretical approach that how animal rights uh, could be preserved. If you go back to the history, then you as I, as I pointed out earlier that we still live in a culture of anthropocentrism. We have not given up, we have accepted the values of anthropocentrism and we have accepted it so deeply that it is difficult to give up that attitude, but it is not impossible. So, the point is in an anthropocentric world, humans are always treated as uh, superior to other animals and this is what the Judeo-Christianic tradition has talk, uh, talks about. But within that western philosophical tradition, you find there is a conflict. In the Greek philosophy itself, there are, there are uh, alternative voices which has been raised. Now, in Greek philosophy, when you treat human as uh, a very respectable entity, then you respect them because they are rational beings, they are linguistic beings and humans have a very unique functions of being linguistic, being rational because it is the human being who are capable of building institutions. Animals and non-humans do live a societal life, have some a rudimentary form of societal life, but they do not build institutions, they do not their intentionality or their intentional attitudes are very very limiting attitudes, uh, limiting to their own uh, community, but when it comes to the human uh, society, uh, humanity has expressed some kind of a unique linguistic functions where certain values are preserved and they are preserved by developing unique institutions. Institutions are grounded on certain norms or rules or principles and these principles are sufficient enough to regulate human conduct. So, most of us are behaving better because we have institutions today. You have institution today to regulate our conduct and that is and that is something very unique about um, human life and that has been made possible because we are not only rational beings, but also uh, linguistic beings. Now, this is a passage which I, I was referring to yesterday and uh, please have a look on uh, to this passage that how uh, an anthropocentric view uh, is derived uh, from the classical thinking, uh, religious belief. But there are certainly uh, a kind of a modified version. These religions have tried to modernize themselves, try to they have lived up to a level where they have tried to see that yes, whatever uh, wrong has been done, has done. Now, let us do modify our approach. 
so there has been some kind of a revision in that but if you look at if you try to trace where it has come from then possibly this is uh, where it has uh, come uh, from uh, in the western tradition so uh, therefore what kind of possibilities that we are looking for the possibility is that we are using animals for food we are using animals for agriculture transports etc etc now can we minimize can we have technology which will help us in uh, performing better in agriculture in technology in transport and can we have alternative food items if we advocate say for example if we advocate vegetarianism can we have an alternative to that that has to be really something that we need to think upon that issues now i also talked about uh, a kind of uh, possibility where i uh, mentioned about moral extensionism that is a concept where that how this is possible how animal rights is possible this is not a very distant dream people who are advocating animal rights see it as a kind of a possibility because we have the humanity has experienced a society where there was slavery and today people condemn slavery humanity has experienced some kind of a sexism what we called where there is a inequality between the, the two sex say male female inequality humanity has also experienced this gender inequalities for a long but today we live in a societies where women are also equally respected these are the success uh, which humanity has experienced racism we, we do condemn racism we do condemn colonial attitudes so therefore looking at this success story of the slave uh, slavery sexism racism and colonialism we find in future if we change our attitude then maybe now we will succeed much larger sense to propagate this uh, and maintain animal rights and uh, that will help us equally to preserve uh, on it now uh, if you are talking about uh, uh, human animal relationship then human see the animals as fit to use and so there there is no direct uh, duties to animals so most of our relationship is an indirect relations i think that is something need to be revised because most of us look at the, when we are using slaves slaves were used as a kind of a property people used to buy slaves and use them as a property so in a very inhuman ways one human was used as a property similarly before the feminist movement uh you look at some societies where women were treated as a property so right to property is something was very direct but when we talk about animal we still use animals as our properties and therefore we have every right to mistreat them or ill treat them they have they become victim of our um, action our voluntary actions so therefore we need to revise this sense of belongingness revise this uh, notion of property and property rights so that as i was talking about biotic equality is maintained the duty uh, of humans is that what we owe to each other do we owe anything as the owner of the property that is i think very important and the other one is when we treat the animals do we really like that treatment are we um, expressing some form of an uh, cruelty and uh, that has to be discouraged condemned uh, things like that so our mode of engagement has to be changed then only this concept of duty will be meaningful to us if at all we have duty to other so for example people who condemn child labor they think they feel that every child has a right to live right to grow as an independent individual in the society 
Similarly, when we express our feelings and uh, know, uh, actions to the animals, we also have a similar kind of feeling or we need to cultivate this refined feeling that we have a duty to preserve this extinct any species, so that they helps us indirect and directly to develop ourselves as better human beings or develop ourselves as a better society. So, we should discourage cruelty towards animals that is the uh, message. So, we will have a better sense of duty uh, towards them. As I told you that uh, within western tradition there are critics, uh, there are philosophers uh, who have been raising voice against uh, the cruelty to animals. Pythagoras, one of the uh, Greek uh, classical Greek philosopher during the time of Socrates and Plato, Pythagoras talks about vegetarianism. He believes that, that every animal or every non-human beings, living beings possess a soul and they undergo some kind of a incarnation. This kind of understanding was prevailing in the classical history of western philosophy, western philosophical tradition. And similarly, people who have heard of Jean Rousseau, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Jean Jeremy Bentham, uh, Bentham who himself was a utilitarian, but advocated uh, animals uh, that having uh, the capacity to reason out things, capacity to, to judge things. So, animals are uh, incapable of reason, which was an Aristotelian uh, attitude, was little very critically looked uh, at by two important philosophers. One is uh, Jean Jacques Rose, Rousseau and another is Jeremy Bentham. They are sentient beings and therefore, they suffer. Like we suffer, we feel pain and uh, similarly, animals do feel pain. So, therefore, we should not inflict pain on animals. Like we do not allow somebody else inflicting pain uh, on us. We discourage it because we suffer. What we aspire to have, what we desire rather is happiness. Similarly, if we compare that uh, or uh, think in this line that animals who are sentient beings, they do suffer and we should not inflict pain, that could be an approach which uh, uh, Bentham brings to us. Then Darwin, Charles Darwin himself also advocated uh, that the animals are capable of emotions and feelings. They are not only uh, having ability to judge things. Say for example, in, in many uh, times if you have looked at into discovery channels or some animal planets, now, the animals, our pets basically, they sense the natural calamities much faster than the human sensibility. So, uh, their sense is quite subtle and the sensitivity, the power of sensitivity is so strong that this sense is much faster than, much ahead of us than we sense. So, they give a kind of an alarming sound or, or they express a gesture that helps uh, the humanity to great extent. So, that is what uh, know, needs to be uh, looked at when we talk about uh, animal ethics. That why we should respect animals, why we should not inflict pain, why we should not kill animals unnecessarily, that you know, those considerations can be taken into account. Now, then Henry Salt, you people who have read Gandhi's my experiment, uh, a story of my experiment with truth will know that how uh, Gandhi himself formed a vegetarian club and uh, Salt was one of his you know a favorite person who uh, with whom he interacted. So, the, the whole idea is that vegetarianism and that is what uh, the, the Salt writings helped Gandhi to uh, change his attitude. Vegetarianism is also good for health. It is not that uh, those who are vegetarian are weak. Now, Gandhi had this uh, kind of uh, understanding in the beginning. Um, uh, particularly in his childhood. He believed that those who eat non-vegetarian food are only strong and uh, those who eat vegetarian food, they are weak. So, uh, when he encountered uh, salt and later on fol uh, formed a vegetarian uh, club or was part of the vegetarian club initially, is something uh, one can look at. Uh, 
So, uh, Salt argues that argues against the vivisection of animals, any living animals and uh, he strongly argues in favor of vegetarianism and so also Bernard Shaw and Peter Singer. Now, Peter Singer's argument uh, in favor of the treatment of uh, you know, uh, animals and vegetarianism is something very significant today. Peter Singer is one of the living philosophers in 21st century who has written a book on animal liberation. Singer argues that uh, argues a concept called preference utilitarianism. Preference utilitarianism is something different from what we understand uh, utilitarianism. Let us understand what is utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is a concept, as an ethical concept. I have discussed little bit on that uh, when I was talking about the types of ethics, deontological ethics, religious ethics, and the consequentialist ethics. The consequentialists are utilitarian. Utilitarians argue that all forms of utilitarianism define the right action as whatever will produce the best outcome for all affected they differ about the good. The idea here is that whatever is good for us, whatever has got maximum utility for the consumer that has to be used for the well-being of maximum number of people. So, maximum happiness for maximum number of people is the slogan. So, if uh, x is an item and x has got some utility. Now, the consumer has to see how many people will be affected, how many people really uh, will enjoy the utility of the particular item called x. Now, if x would satisfy the maximum number of people, then utilitarianism will accept x as a kind of a valued item. So, it is in that form all forms of utilitarianism needs to look at or maximum amount of happiness that a consumer gathers from the utility of a particular good is something that has to be keep in uh, mind when we try to understand Peter Singer's uh, preference utilitarianism. Preference utilitarianism say, uh, argues that whatever maximizes the satisfaction of the preferences involved which may not necessarily be their own happiness. If something is not on the contrary to the utilitarian thesis per se, preference utilitarianism argues that it may not be necessarily be their own happiness. It may not be necessarily you know, bringing happiness to me, but if some preference is to be given for the benefit of or for the well-being of some other community then we should try to maximize that and we should try to include that within our ethical standard. So, that interest of that community or the well-being of that community is been protected. So, that is what uh, the preference utilitarianism precisely argued. As I uh, told you about the feminist movement, uh, the, the gender inequality which was prevailing in our society. Now, this has been argued looking at their success stories of slavery and gender inequalities. Acceptance of women ethnic minorities are equal to those of males, because something is good for us. If we live in an equal society, if I treat my, my mother, my wife, my daughters in a family that are equal to me and give up my patriarchal attitude, then that is always good for a family. So, here the attitude is that whatever is maximizing the satisfaction of mine, preference will be given to that. So, gender equality will be maintained precisely because that will bring good to the family, that will bring good to the society, that will bring good to all kinds of institutions where women play a very important uh, role women's are decision makers. So, that will help the society to grow in much larger and better way. Now, uh, when we when it comes to um, entertainment, how and gratification of pleasure, you may you may come across that there, there are still some corner of India, you have uh, people believe in 
religious sacrifices where cocks, uh, sometimes uh, a buffalo, uh, sometimes a goat is been sacrificed. I think we need to change that attitude. We need to modernize ourselves. We need to think that you know, the animals also have life and they should not sacrifice uh, their life for our well-being. And there was preference utilitarianism also has uh, uh, you know, reflects upon this idea that recently when there was a, uh, there is a uh, ban on beef in Bombay, people have started thinking whether Dharavi's leather market will be affected uh, by such ban on beef. Now, uh, preference utilitarianism um, argues that if we stop uh, collectively, individually or from an individual point of view, if certain actions are being performed, it may not have impact on market. So, but a collective performance, a collective action will definitely have some impact on the market. Because suppose I become, you know, I, I am a consumer of uh, non-vegetarian uh, food and all in a sudden I change myself that yes, I uh, would like to have vegetarian food now onwards and this attitude of mine may not have a greater impact in the market. But if it becomes a collective demand, if vegetarian is becomes a collective demand, then gradually it will have impact on the market. So, therefore, uh, it is important that we should cease to treat animals in ways that cause them suffer to you and to use them for food uh, is to inflict suffering on the animals. So, the medical research using animals offer potential benefits to humans. Though the pay of rate is low, much research is into conditions that suffer being upon themselves by choosing unhealthy and high risk lifestyle. You will be surprised that many times the drugs are being tested not only on animals, but also on human beings. In the third world countries, the poverty rate is so high, people test drugs on them. So, uh, we actually, Peter Singer's concern is that when we look at uh, the animal life and when we look at the human life, human life ridden with poverty, um, malnutrition and being also the victim of this type. I think such an unhealthy practice, it is morally unhealthy practice and involves a high risk in our lifestyles and that has to be stopped. We need to stop it uh, for our well-being, for our good. Thank you.